people to tweet live, and he wanted Thanks, to. Thanks, Chris. Sure, but it's kind of something you need to know in advance, right? I know, totally. <laughs> That's too so, much yeah. to think about. Okay, and uh, I don't know, uh, you, you know how much time you have, but uh, before the next talk begins, uh, we're going to just have to let you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I will show you. Do you have the, the time? Ten minutes. Thing? Okay, yes. perfect. Yeah. So, just, just look at her from time to time, so <laughs> you don't run out of time. Yeah, you're sitting here right now. Yeah, sure, yes, sure. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. just ready when you are. Awesome. Yeah. And, uh, and if, if, if you talk and sorry, you have more time to talk to other people. <laughs> <laughs> yes, how much time do I have? Is it 40 minutes? 30 seconds. No, I mean like the whole talk. Ah, the whole talk. Yeah. Uh, 50 minutes. You know, no, no, you usually, no, you usually have like uh, at least 13 minutes. And it depends how many questions you have. Like, yeah. You know. So the next talk will start in a break. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but there's no so, break or anything in between. So okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't wanna... This is why we try to keep yeah. track of time. Yeah. Because totally. We want you to talk to people, but we also want other people to go to other talks. Totally. This is why if the next talk is more important. Use all the time. I want to go to other talks too. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yep. If, if you're okay with, um, you know, finishing up with whatever you're doing 10 minutes before the next talk, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. it should work out for you. And you remember, you have your speaker's interview afterwards. Oh, you have I to forgot go back about that. To, um, speaker's room, yeah. where you arrived. Yeah, I have to remind everyone. Yeah. There is a person. It's on the main level. Nice. And then yeah, uh, I can walk you there if you want. Ask any volunteer, ask yeah. any staff person. I'll figure it out. Okay, perfect. Senior speaker, yeah, whatever. Okay, do um, you have any questions? Enjoy it. Okay, please do. Hey. Um, right oh, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. This is great. Time to start. Yes, you're ready. Uh, uh, I know, man. <laughs> I actually got to sleep last night, which is amazing. But normally I'm a total disaster the night before, but... Yes, we're ready whenever. Yeah. I'm just gonna, yeah, go ahead. Okay, we're ready to start. So please welcome our next speaker. It's Chris Craglick. He is a research scientist at Flash And it's gonna be a, a demo-based presentation yeah. about real-time streaming advanced analytics. Uh, and hey, what's up, everyone? Yo! Yo. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can you all hear me? Hello, hello, hello. Okay. Am I like on a. Oh, okay. I don't think it's not on either. Oh, hello. Thank you. Okay. 
All right, so yeah, I just have to yell out, I guess, right? Is that perfect? Um, get one thing going here. Okay, so today's talk is going to be totally demo based. Um, I've been doing uh, PowerPoint talks for the last probably year, um, and I'm I just can't look at PowerPoint anymore. I like upgraded recently to the new PowerPoint for uh, really Mac OS and thought that that would renew my interest in PowerPoint. And it, actually, the uh, gradient is sloping uh, downward there to a global uh, minimum. So definitely not. Um, I just get tired of looking at the same slides, the same colors. So I've got enough demos now. Um, I've got this project called Flux Capacitor, also same name as uh, the company. Um, so. Let's just get at it here. Um, let me introduce myself real quick. I've I cheated a little bit and put some slides inside of the notebook, so because <laughs> it's just easier for me to convey. Uh, this is me, Chris Fregley. Uh, there's my yeah, that's my emoji. Someone bought me stickers uh, for my emo so if you guys want one, I have about uh, 492 left or yeah, 98 <laughs> left. Yeah, because I I have two of them. No one else wants them, um, but. <laughs> Uh, yeah, currently research scientists. We're in like stealth mode. I just like saying that. I don't really know. Um, I'm going to tell you guys what I'm working on, so it's just fun. But yeah, we're going to bring AI back to the future. That's what. Yeah, that's our goal here. Um, organizer. Yeah. So there's this meetup, the Advanced Spark and TensorFlow meetup. Probably 70 to 80 percent of the meetups are actually here at Galvanize. Uh, yeah, right, the guys have been very nice to me. Um, I worked with IBM before, who w would sponsor all the food and everything. So. Um, I'm on my own now. I'm going to be doing my own sponsoring. If anyone else wants to offer up pizza or beer or whatever, please do. Um, we actually had Martin Oderski uh, a few months ago, I think back in January, if you guys remember. We were like hired his son at, at the Spark Tech Center, Jacob, um, yeah, who's a super nice kid. And yeah, his dad was coming into town to visit him, and we somehow yeah, had him come work uh, the like, evening shift at the meetup. So that was pretty big. Right, like one thing, yes, I plan to speak after him. And that's the worst idea ever to try to speak after Martin Odersky because right, like half the room left because right, like he spoke and it was awesome, and then the other half went and talked to him after the talk, and it was just like me and like four people. So, uh, yeah, no for the future. Don't ever do that. Um, working on a book. Yeah, let's see, Pancake Stack. I, yeah, I've realized I'm kind of a marketing. Uh, yeah, I don't want to say the word, but yeah, yeah, marketing uh, person here, I guess, because I just I've got about 30, 50 uh, domain names. Pancake Stack. This is kind of a mockery of the Smack Stack, but right, like which yes, I was part of last year. Uh, this conference actually last year is when we first uh, trained people on the Smack Stack. So it was me and uh, about four other guys. Uh, one guy from Confluent. Um, People from Data Stacks for Cassandra. Uh, we had a guy from TypeSafe for Akka. Uh, me for Spark, and yeah, what's the other one? Uh, we had a guy from Mesosphere as well that all presented um, as part of training. So this year I had to up the ante a little bit. Um, I pulled in Pancake because uh, it kind of went with Stack and it, it just got out of control from there. So um, I actually got in trouble recently for this because I didn't have right, like the the uh, first part, the Apache word, right, like before all of them. And, and yeah, so this picture got uh, like tweeted out. And some dudes from the ASF contacted me directly and were like, yeah, like let's put A and right, like put the full word Apache. And then I was thinking about it, and that yes, yeah, so I reminded them that it's just gonna be like pa sta, you know, like it's gonna be all A's, and so that's not fun. Uh, so yeah, they let me keep this this particular slide and keep the acronym, but um, it's yeah, pancake-stack.com if you got and it uh, but yeah, there's really nothing there. Uh, workshop also pretty much always here at Galvanize. Uh, next one is actually not at Galvanize, uh, June 4th. And then back at Galvanize here in San Francisco on June 6th, where we do a full day and cover all of these. Um, so today's thing is basically going to be this that whole eight hour workshop, but in 40, 50 minutes. So, uh, formerly IBM Spark Tech Center, Databricks, and Netflix. So, yeah, a lot of X there. Um, data sets that we're going to use. There's this labeled faces in the wild. Have you guys heard of this? So they've actually gone through and pre-processed. There's uh, 
I think it's 1,300 or 1,600 uh, like celebrities, and you know it's Tom Cruise and the Brad Pitts and uh, right, like the Angelinas, and they've they've done all the sort of face alignment stuff, um, and we're going to build eigenfaces, basically run PCA on these faces and make right like real time recommendations um, if you pass in Tom Cruise's face, right? Like who? So say that you liked Tom Cruise, right? Like you're on or like some. Right, like what's the dating site, Tinder, uh, something like that. If you're just swiping, swiping. If you swipe on Tom Cruise, who else looks like Tom Cruise? So yeah, we'll do that one, which is kind of fun. There's some surprising results there. Um, of course, movie lens. Yeah, coming from Netflix, I have to get some movie stuff in there. And then just kind of my own handmade uh, data sets as well. So what's the other thing? I used to call this talk Spark After Dark, and it creeped some people out, I think. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I was in London speaking, and uh, yeah, and I made some, yeah, some like reference to this dating site, and got some like negative feedback. So I, I sort of de-emphasized the whole dating site. But that's right. Like that was initially what like Flux Faster was was going to be a mock dating site and to generate recommendations and uh, things like that. So actually, the Spark After Dark stuff was kind of inspired by this blog post called Tinderbox. Um, Right, like, have you guys heard about this? There's a guy up in Vancouver. It's hilarious. So this guy basically wanted to automate his dating, his swiping. Um, so yeah, he does just that, right? Like with the eigenfaces, where basically after I think it's 150 swipes, right, the system learns the sort of average or like eigenface, the uh, top, you know, top 10 features or whatever, and then can start to auto swipe after that. Yeah. So the guy reverse engineered Tinder's API and was pulling in pictures and really like, doing auto swiping. Um, yeah, here's his like dashboard. Uh, if you guys get a chance to read it, just Google Tinderbox. It's hilarious. Um, the other thing too, yeah. So here's the eigenface thing. We're actually going to recreate that. He has a, this chatbot thing as well uh, that uses sentiment analysis. So he basically automates and just sends out just right, like sort of generic things like, "Hey, how was your weekend?" or Right, like you look like trouble or something. That's one of my uh, buddy's favorite ones. Yeah, apparently that one works a lot. So I, uh, yeah, I should start like incorporating that. But um, you can just do st the uh, just normal Stanford Core NLP, which is what he's using, or uh, right, like you can use RNNs, right, like LSTMs, and, and basically figure out how their response is. Right, because it's not like they're really. Yeah, so people don't really read these profiles. Right, they just look at the picture, and if it's a normal. Right, like, hello, or like, how was your weekend? They're either going to respond or they're not going to respond. That's his theory anyway. So if they make it past a couple chat bots, then it goes and we'll actually notify the user and it shows up on his dashboard and then he'll, he'll actually start to personalize some of the uh, conversation there. Yeah, so he'll actually read their profile. Uh, something else, too, that we'll, we'll touch on a little bit. This is kind of the holy grail here is streaming matrix factorization. And surprisingly... So when people talk about Spark or they talk about TensorFlow, uh, they're typically talking ab about the training side of things, right? There's this whole segment, and this is what my company's focusing on, which is the serving side of things. So think of Prediction IO, think of, um, yeah, there's a bunch of them, right? So it would be nice to actually build the model and then inside of a notebook, for example, say deploy, and then have a cluster and right, like have it Netflix scalable. Um, actually, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but... So there's two things that uh, like we're going to start working on, which is that side of things, deploying, and then also streaming. Make, so these sort of online algorithms, right? Like not a lot of these algorithms can be done online training, um, where you're training every right, like batch interval, right? Like every uh, like 500 milliseconds. I mean, that, that's kind of ridiculous, but right, like maybe training every 10 seconds, right? Like just sort of varying the weights a little bit, um, and then redeploying the model. Uh, things like that. So, and then things like pinning models against each other to right to see which ones are uh, like more effective. A/B testing, um, right? The multi-arm bandits, things like that. So basically, trying to incorporate streaming and then deployment and then that whole feedback loop, right? So uh, these are tough problems. There's a lot of ops stuff that I don't really want to do, but um, at Netflix, we right, it's kind of no ops kind of thing. So uh, yes, I get a lot of experience doing that. So this is one of the components uh, that we're using heavily from Netflix, which is Hystrix. So this is where, um, yeah, right, does anyone know about this? 
So basically, if there's right, sort of an edge service, so at Netflix there were edge services that we had that faced the customer that right, like talked to the devices, or right, like devices talked to the edge service. That service then talked to right, like tons and tons of other services that were right, like behind the firewall. So that's all these services, for example. So uh, you know, it would be like the video metadata. So that's things like the description, the director, uh, right, like where it was set, you know, things like that. Um, there's also, and it's not on here, but so there'd be some sort of personalization service or some sort of recommendation service, right, that would actually serve up the top ten shows or movies, right, to that users. But it was our service that was sort of aggregating all this. So say that that right, like dependent service was down, or started to right, like slow down a little bit, or it was getting overloaded, right, like some way to sort of right, like open up that circuit and then let the traffic drain and then let the service Really come back online. So that's kind of what you're seeing here. This big bubble here, that's uh, like the overall volume relative to these other ones. Um, you can see, and like throughout the day, certain services will, you know, open, close, things like that. Um, and then there's all these, yeah, so there's tons of like timeouts and, right, so after maybe like two minutes of this or, or like five minutes of this. Oh, and so when you're in that state, you're now returning fallbacks, which could just be the top 10 movies overall. So it's non-personalized, but from the user's perspective, it's not the most optimal experience, but it's still right, like happening. They can still continue to use the service, right? So Ops loves it because uh, it shows us as really right, being available 100%. Um, but right, like we're just in a degraded state, and so once that service can recover, right, then things get back, or they can, um, at some point, that dependent service can then auto scale up or. Right, like their group gets involved and then can uh, right, like make their uh, like service larger, scale out a little bit. So this is a lot of the operational stuff that we're working on. Um, so let's show some of it here. Actually, let's do this. This is going to be a live, live demo with you guys involved. So I need your help. If you guys can go to... How do I do the... Oh, there we go. If you can go to demoadvancedspark.com, or yeah, demo.advancedspark.com. If you guys can go to this URL, yeah, you can do it from your phone, you can do it from your laptop, wherever. Uh, select the top five technologies, maybe, that you currently use in production. What we're going to do here is generate live personalized recommendations for. Uh, right, like this particular group. So this is just typical collaborative filtering, right, like alternating least squares. Uh, the sort of intuition here is that we'll pick, we'll right, like each pick five technologies, and then I'll run the algorithms, and then it'll actually, specific to, right, like you guys, pick some other technologies that maybe you should be looking at based on what this group currently uses. Okay, so... Let's see, I think I already picked some of mine here. Docker, yeah, I don't actually use these. I'm just clicking randomly at this point, but. Uh, and if you feel like poking around, um, yeah, actually don't poke around just yet because it might screw things up. Uh, oh, that, that actually explains. Yeah, so I put it up here for convenience because like during the workshop, we if you get lost, you can always go back to this page. It's sort of the home page. But each time that you come back to this page, it's going to regenerate this unique ID just because I'm like the worst JavaScript developer ever. Uh, so if that, if like this ID changes, it's no longer personalized to you, right? You basically have to click on the same page that you have that ID. Okay, so I assume people have clicked. Let's hop on over here. Right, does anyone use Zeppelin? Yeah. Hi, Roman. Hey. <laughs> yeah, anyone else? Or right, like IPython or anything? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah, so you guys get the workbook. Um, so just so now this is gonna power this first link here. The first link is, is gonna be uh, non-personalized. This is just kind of summary statistics, top five. Uh, just yeah, just based on count. Um, 
This next link, which, yeah, don't, don't click it just yet, uh, will be the uh, personalized recommendation. So here we ran, I just ran. Here's, we're just pulling in reference data here just so that I can display the images. Uh, here, so I should probably show you guys the overall flow. Yes, I know I'm kind of bouncing around here. I'm, I'm a bit of a spaz when it comes to the live, live demo format. I say flexible. Yeah, you might say spaz. Um, so we're the users in the upper left clicking. And click, click, click. This is going through NiFi, which is doing geo enrichment. So it's taking a look at the IP. Um, I don't have to use NiFi for this. It's kind of silly that I do um, because it, really NiFi is a pretty powerful thing that uh, does way more than just geo. Uh, but I was trying to find a use for it in the demo, and that, that was a good use case. Um, goes, it uh, then goes to Kafka. So NiFi, if you guys haven't seen, looks like it's kind of this data flow thing. This is now a Hortonworks project, came out of the NSA. Uh, Hortonworks snapped them up, I think, six months or eight, eight months after they um, separated from the NSA, broke out, if you will. So let me see here. If you click in... Uh, so this is the actual request handler. So my JavaScript talks to this thing, which is just a Jetty server, just a like, super simple version right now. You can kind of see some of the data flowing through here. Um, looks like 179 came in. Uh, goes, we're checking, we're gonna do the geo right here. Uh, and then we're gonna put into Kafka. And there's right, like a bunch of failure queues and things like that that it goes to, but let me kind of show you real quick what the Geo one would look like. Oops, oh, that's a, a central process group. So here's the Enrich Geo. Um, these are called processors, basically just nodes in this flow. This is the database, it's the uh, classic uh, like MaxBind one, pulling out the HTTP remote host and sticking in um, so that's, that's pulling it out. This is actually adding it here to the request. And then if it's not known, it'll stick in unknown. And then goes to success and kind of continues on. So once it puts it into Kafka, it's sort of out of the picture. One cool thing about NiFi, just since we're in here, is this thing called data provenance, which I didn't, uh, I hadn't put this term together. Um, I didn't realize that, that this was a big thing, but... Um, this is a way to actually track all messages throughout the entire system. So you can actually like, click on here. Um, you, you can see this. So this drop is where it drops it into the Kafka topic. Uh, if we take a look at, I think there's a way to, oops, I'm downloading. That's not what I wanted to do. Yeah, so there's a way to actually go in and look at the data before and after. So these transformations, like we could see the request before it was enriched and then after. So before it was just a host and then right like afterward actually has right like San Francisco or whatever in it. Um, is it this one? No. Yeah, anyway. So let's get back to here. And then we have uh, Spark Streaming. We could use Flink. Yeah, I've been seeing a lot more Flink just in the last couple months. Um, at some point, hopefully Kafka streams. That way I can get rid of a lot of, of this crap here and just use Kafka for everything. Um, we're storing it into Cassandra. So that's why this next step, so yeah, this is the overall flow. So those are the ratings going there. Spark streaming, putting it into Cassandra. We're now becoming data scientist person down here. Um, we opened up Zeppelin, we started running models. Right, so obviously some of this would be done batch, sort of offline, in you know some some kind of job scheduler like Airflow. Um, once we get the actual streaming, right, like online matrix factorization stuff working, then it's going to be super incremental, and then right, like could be every five seconds we're, we'll be training, but we're not quite there yet. Um, that's yeah, so that'll be done uh, here pretty soon, but. Um, we're then going to deploy. So to deploy, we can deploy to Redis, uh, which is pretty much what like Netflix does. They have a memcache, this huge memcache cluster uh, fronted by this 
or like open source project they have, uh, it's called EV Cash. Uh, if it, I, I can't remember what the EV stands for anymore. Um, but yeah, basically huge memcache. Uh, so I'm storing it into Elasticsearch just because it has a nice REST API. And because I'm not a good JavaScript developer, I just want super easy REST access to my data. Um, with Redis, there's something called WebDisk, that, right? That's actually pretty cool. Um, so I'm, I'm probably going to switch over to Redis here pretty soon. So yeah, we'll deploy it. And then when you guys click two and three, that's where this data is coming from, is from Elasticsearch, essentially. So let's go back here. We should be able to click two. OK, so these are the top five for this crowd, which kind of makes sense. HDFS up there, Kafka, Scala, since this is basically a Scala conference, uh, and then Amazon. So let's do the next. We're back to being data scientist person, trying out their models. Here, we're going to do ALS. You guys uh, familiar with right, like matrix factorization, collaborative filtering type stuff? Yeah, there's probably like, a, a, yeah, there's varying degrees here. So I'll just kind of uh, like level set. Basically, take a snapshot of that matrix. So this is each time someone uh, like selected a particular software, it's going to put a one in there. Yes, yeah, so this diagram is a little bit old. This was back in my uh, right, like Spark After Dark Tinder stuff where you could swipe left for, no, for zero and swipe right for one. So right now, we're only doing ones. Um, so this would be, if you're user number three and, or two, you liked software uh, there and there. So the second and fourth slot, which would be right, like index one and three or whatever. Um, so if you take a snapshot of this, which is what we're going to do right now, let me get it started, and you factor it out into two smaller matrices, right? And it's smaller because we're choosing K, which is uh, called rank, right? Um, it's similar to like K-means in the right, like sort of intuition where we're guessing that there's, there's K, which is right, like going to be smaller, so maybe 10 or 20, right? Like sort of hidden features that lies within this data set, right? This matrix. And like we're not quite sure, but let's right, like factor it out so that when this is all done and factored, that matrix times that matrix gets as close to this current snapshot as possible, right? Yeah, so once we actually get those two smaller rank matrices, now we can do some cool stuff. And so one of the things that people do is, is change the value of K, right? And then keep running it um, and seeing what they're finding. So uh, let's do it here. I think I picked K 10 or 20. So there's the metadata again. Yeah, so I'm like redoing a lot of stuff because sometimes I run these notebooks out of order and I want to make sure that like I don't screw things up. But that's the one right, like, sort of downside with notebook development. If you start kind of poking around and doing cell five first and then you go up to cell two, you know, things get all screwy, uh, especially in a collaborative, uh, really multi-tenant uh, sort of environment. So here we're pulling the ratings out of Cassandra again. Rank is 10, passing some other hyperparameters here. Uh, giving it to what's called ALS, so alternating least squares, uh, form of matrix factorization. It's just where you hold one side fixed and then you alternate, or you hold one side fixed and solve for that side, then you hold this side fixed and solve for that side, sort of alternate back and forth maximum 20 times. Uh, if, or if things don't change, if things stop changing below a particular threshold, then stop, right? There's two stop criteria here. So some data frame stuff here, Scala magic. So here's the final. So now this would be the two. Uh, oh, so this is kind of, yeah, so here's this transform method. Now this is on the actual ALS model that was built on the, right, that current Cassandra data. So this is the huge matrix now of the recommendations sorted by, grouped by user, uh, sorted by confidence. So these are the top one, two, three, four, five. So we should be able to, oh, and then I save it into Elasticsearch later on. Um, let me get to that in a second here, but here we're actually saving it to Elasticsearch right there. So if we go back here, we should be able to click this, and there's my recommendations. Now, if you notice, I didn't do a very good job filtering out ones I, I selected, so it's actually recommending ones that I've already <laughs> selected. Um, I keep trying to, I, let's 
it's like super easy to fix. I just keep forgetting to do it. I keep focusing on the hard stuff, and then, um, but okay. So back to here. I just want to point a couple things out. So here I'm dumping out the entire Rightly matrix, right? The or so now this is a different right like table. This is so this is user ID, this is item ID, and then confidence. So this is what I'll be using to serve up recommendations. But there's one other, there's like two other cool things that uh, like come out of here, which is I now have a way to represent my items in this new smaller space, right? This new smaller rank. So each item can now be represented by this new right, like matrix or each vector. Each item can now be represented by a vector that's part of the sort of item factor that's been like, factored out. So now this is useful because now I can actually right, like, cluster based on this. So right, like this whole goal of like feature engineering and stuff is to take right, these like, right, like items and, and like users and then break them down some way into some right, like, numeric format, some sort of feature format right, that I can pass into like other algorithms. So what we're going to do is actually, so like this would be item one, this would be item two, this would be item three. Um, yeah, so these would typically be like point two and point eight and stuff. I, yeah, I should probably change this because this is one of the uh, like major diagrams that I have here. But right, so again, so when these are multiplied together, they would end up like this. But I now have a way to represent this user is this particular vector, and then that, that second user is that particular vector. So I can actually find similar users and like cluster users based on this new data that came out of a collaboration of users and items. So this is some sort of hidden, you know, really meaning to this. So what's cool is that, right, like for example, Netflix can take these and find these sort of weird categories of items or these weird clusters. So not just by typical genre, right, by horror and comedy and things like that, but actually, uh, right, like my favorite, I was just in Canada last week and um, it's like Canadian, uh, it's like gory Canadian films targeted at people between the ages of 25 and 30, right? So they can get that specific with their, and that's because, and it's not really, it, it has to be human interpreted, right? Because like, it's sort of the same thing with like K-means or, um, Right, like LDA topic analysis on like corpuses of text where you sort of give it some right, like arbitrary number of topics and then have it return to you the top 10 terms per topic. And it takes the human to sort of say, oh yeah, this topic is about right, like biology. This one's about physics. So um, I thought I had a slide in here later, but that shows some of the goofy ones that uh, came out of Netflix, but right, like very, very, very specific ones. So right, like these are powerful because now you have Right, these clusters that, that didn't normally exist. Um, okay, so let me show you what I, I do with that here. I actually, so this model, when you build it, lets you build this entire matrix, which is what I saved, in, or, or like this entire table, which I saved um, into Elasticsearch to power the third link. But then also, you can actually get the user factors. So that's the smaller rank matrix going up and down this way. And then I can get the item vectors. So this is for user ID. This is the vector. It's just, you know, it's just a bunch of numbers, but that's cool. Yeah, I can pipe that into a clustering algorithm. Uh, here's, I call model, get me the item vectors. So this is item number one. So each technology, it's uh, one index. So, you know, seven, I think, is Spark. So now I've represented Spark. Yes, I can pipe this in. And now I can find similar things, uh, right? Like, so. Yeah, so this gives me the ability to do item to item similarity, right? So I can, yes, yeah, so I'll do that here in a sec. Um, is there anything else? I should probably point out too that, so now this is proof here for this user ID 12663 and for the item ID 7. So uh, if I multiply those two vectors to the dot product of that vector and then that vector, should give me the exact, so let's see, what's the value here? 0 0.99200. And so, th so that should be the exact same confidence that this big table gave me for uh, item ID. Let's see, where's the big table? 
So user ID 12663, item ID, where'd it go? 12663, item ID, seven is point nine nine two so this is right so this was generated by the actual ALS model and then this is if I actually do the matrix multiplication myself just to you know really taking each of those vectors and then multiplying them together so that would be this thing I'm just doing vectors dense calling blast dot product uh, the exact same value so let me jump ahead right here to the user user similarity so this is going to find users in this room that are similar to each other. It's actually not that interesting because we don't really know who the users are and it's kind of, yeah, I don't really want to ask. It'll take forever to resolve. But uh, user ID 12663 is similar to these people. Here's the similarity. What I'm doing here is I'm taking the vector from the user factor. So I guess it would actually be that vector because it's in this that uh, matrix over here and multiplying it by all of the other, uh, or no, and then I'm just finding, let's see, how does this work? Yeah, so I'm just taking that vector and then doing cosine similarity to all the other, right, like users represented by that same vector, and then show me which users are the most similar. And we could do the same, so this one's a little more interesting, let's do the same with item to item similarity. It's a big scary warning for myself because I always forget to run He's in order. Sometimes I bounce around in my spasticity. So here we're going to find items based on this collaboration similar to Spark, which is item number seven. I just happen to know that. So based on what we've all chosen, Zookeeper. Wow, Yarn, Cassandra. Uh, so in a recommendations uh, you know, standpoint, I would um, probably maybe recommend because you selected Spark, I would show these five, and then I would, you know, kind of keep keep adding them on based on what's in your shopping cart or whatnot. Here we're going to use k-means on the items, so item to item. Ah, yeah. So here's, so we're going to run k-means again on that just that top item factor uh, matrix, and figure out what are some of the hidden. So yeah, here's some examples. Here's the gory Canadian revenge movies. That's what it was. Uh, cerebral military movies based on real life, right? So again, these were humans that were going in and taking uh, that data that they found, and right, they played with K a bunch of times. Um, I can't remember what uh, K this was specifically, but um, yeah, kind of interesting. Yeah, raunchy mad scientist comedy. But like you'll see this on like Apple Music. I finally switched over to Apple Music. Uh, I bought CarPlay for my car because my stereo was like super old. And they put Spotify on like page two. So I, I finally, I was like, all right, I'll just get, right. So they, they, right, like Spotify was on the main thing, but then, yeah, they released Apple Music. And then, so you have to like page over to the second page of CarPlay. And yeah, that's, yeah, that's accident prone, right? Like versus all the other stuff I'm, I'm doing, like selecting music and like texting and everything. Um, yeah, that's the one thing I should be. So here we're going to cluster. So let's run this based on this collaboration again. Yeah, how much time do I have? It's too... Okay. Oops, what happened there? Oh, I, I think I just changed these imports. Uh, okay. Anyway, this would be... Oh, well, that's no fun. Um, yeah. So this would basically cluster and, and show, right, like which, and, right, so this is cool clustering because this isn't based on any metadata, right? Like this isn't based on the genre and things like that. This is based on this collaboration. Um, I just created my own vectors class the other day, and I, what's the import? Does anyone know the import org spark uh, ML org spark org Apache spark? Uh, ML then alg vectors. If I get that right, I'm buying myself a beer. <laughs> Man, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> this is like all I've looked at for the last like two years of my life. So the, the fact that I 
even doubted I would get that. It's kind of silly. So, so week. yeah, totally, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's the only time I allow myself. Um, so here we're just clustering based on this collaboration. So let's see, cluster centers have been determined, kind of boring, uh, sort of a kind of an indicator of how good your clusters are here within set sum of squared errors, basically how, how tight are the clusters that I found, right? If they're all over the place, it's gonna be a larger number. If it's uh, smaller, that's better. Um, so here we clustered pretty much everything into zero, uh, 2200 and clustered a few, 600 into four and a couple stragglers here in one, two and three. So uh, might need a little work on my clustering um, yeah, algorithm there, but uh, one thing I wanna show, okay, so since we only have a few minutes, yeah, so just to give you an idea, right, like the workshop covers all these, we actually cover uh, graph, right, like a bunch of graph algorithms. Yeah, this one's kind of fun here, similar path. So speaking of, uh, right, like recommendations here, yeah, this is kind of a fun one where, let's say that you're sitting down, so you finally met someone on Spark After Dark specifically, it's such an awesome dating site, um, you're sitting down Friday night, Saturday night, trying to find a movie to watch. You, you can't figure it out. So, yes, yeah, so I had to switch these when I was in London because of the uh, negative feedback I got for being, uh, for, yeah, being stereotypical or whatever. Uh, so I like message in a bottle. Um, that's not a picture of me, but I wish it was. Uh, my non-existent girlfriend likes Mad Max. Um, and we're trying to find a movie that sort of is in between. So typically, and, yeah, let me run this, we'll um, have... An, so this is a combination of like Dijkstra, but we're using the longest path or the heaviest path. So picture, we're going to pre-process and between each vertex, which is a movie, we're going to calculate similarity between all the other movies, right? So there's this, and um, for our case, we're actually just going to use the, uh, right, like genre tags, right? Like adventure, comedy, things like that. Um, for a larger scale thing, you would use like actors and similar plot. Yeah, so Mad Max actually is really very similar to Waterworld, which is kind of funny. Uh, yes, yeah, so obviously Kevin Costner is in uh, right, those two movies as well. So once we build that graph up, we can start at a specific node and say, get me the most similar path, or like pathway through. So from each node, pick the greatest uh, edge weight and just keep going until I get to my final destination. And so let's see. Um, I didn't actually have those two... Uh, that I could find very easily. So I just took Toy Story, which is number one here, and I took Sudden Death, which is number nine. Um, let's see. We're using Jacquard similarity. So here Jacquard similarity is good when you have sort of binary things, right? Like sets, right? So you're, is this element in the same set, right? Like how much overlap is there, right? Like Jacquard similarity is, uh, what is it? It's, it's like the intersection of a set divided by the union of a set, and set here is the genres. So you have this huge vector of genres. You put a one for all the for each genre that this movie represents, um, and run Jacquard similarity. That's that's the similarity function that we're using here. Um, let's see, and build up the similarity graph. Just ignore that. Oh, here's my attempt at. Oh, that's probably going to break. But I was trying to do D three graphs within. Uh, Zeppelin, which is like the hardest thing I've ever done in my software career. Uh, starting with Toy Story, finishing with Sudden Death, get me the heaviest path. So normally you do lightest or shortest path uh, between those two. And these are the movies that come in between. I think I actually break them down here. I thought I did. Uh, 2, 8, 10, and 6. So 2, two is Jumanji. Um, Tom Hutt. So this is a really super small data set. I'm just doing 1 to 10 just... So 2, 8, uh, 10, and 6, I think. Where's 10? Uh, Goldeneye and Heat. I'd probably choose Goldeneye out of all out of those four or five. So it would actually show that. I was trying to show it with D3. Uh, it's pretty tricky. One last one that's going to blow your guys' minds because it, it's, uh, well, because this took me about a year to build, so it better blow your mind. We're back to the eigenfaces thing that I started with. Um, heavily influenced by this book. If you haven't read this book and you're serious about machine learning and Spark, uh, we just hired this guy at the Spark Tech Center. He was my last hire before I left. Uh, I was 
yeah, like we were so stoked. He's a Spark committer. Uh, he's a PMC guy. Uh, he's from South Africa. He's like one of the nicest people I know. Um, and it's it's a tiny bit dated, but if you know right, like data frames, um, you, if you know right, like the old RDDs, it's yeah, it's not that big of a deal. I think they're actually rewriting it. Nick's not doing it, but they have someone else doing it just to update it. But yeah, the algorithms and everything. It, uh, yeah, so I sat down and like read that book and. Uh, probably two or three plane rides. So, okay, five minutes. Um, so PCA, we're basically trying to find the top components that describe a particular data set. So the data set here is that uh, labeled faces in the wild data set where it's um, each actor, uh, right, like actress has a set of uh, picture or facial pictures. They're each 250 by 250, they're color. We're going to actually scale that down to 50 by 50 because I don't have a big enough uh, Spark cluster to process 250 by 250. We're going to simplify it down to grayscale, not color, just to, so that each really item within the matrix is just one value for the grayscale value, not three for RGB. So it's uh, three times less the data. Uh, we're going to convert it, extract it, convert it, grayscale it. We're going to standardize it. This is very important. Um, right, like whenever you get a data set, Think about how you can standardize, normalize it. Here, we're just doing mean, not standard deviation. Uh, transforming it, getting. So principal components are not actual features, right? When you get principal components, you can't really translate those into anything concretely, right? That's the, the kind of sad part. That's right, like the limitation about PCA is that you can't say this particular feature, right, like feature being you know age or uh, right, like something like that, fed into this principal component. You just have to take it for what it's worth. And now it's basically dimensional. Uh, it's yeah. So it's like reducing uh, right, like these dimensions. So that when you feed it into other machine learning algorithms, right, like we're not passing in the entire uh, right, like 250 by 250 pixel uh, like vector that's been flattened, but we're actually just passing in the smaller dimension. So each. So I've basically broke down each image is now represented by these 10, um, oh no, what happened here? NP, uh, okay, Whew. oh my god. Okay, so, yeah, let me just back up for one sec here. I've taken each image and I've broken it down, or no. So I've, I've passed in all of the images, right? And out of all, I think it's, uh, what was it, 1,600 pictures or something, these are the top eight components. So these are the, so in, in terms of PCA, these are the top eight uh, like components that describe all of these pictures, right? So this is Angelina Jolie, this is Tom Cruise, this is everyone here. You can sort of see some of the features being picked up, right? Like a lot of eye stuff, maybe this is, um, you know, hairstyle here. Looks like you got some wrinkles going on there. Each of these has sort of picked up its own. Uh, so now these are the, the, now I've taken the vector and smashed it into I like change the dimensions. Yes, I reshaped it to now show the actual eigen face. So, th so this is eigen. Yes, these are eigen vectors represented uh, in terms of like pictures here. So it kind of gives you an idea. Um, and now we switch over here. We're going to actually. Okay, one minute. Perfect. Uh, oh, so this is the original pixel vector for every image. So this is basically the same thing, but I did it now with ML pipelines. Uh, here we're doing the standard scalar, the exact same thing we did before. This is just a little bit cleaner, right? Like a little bit more new Sparky. Uh, this is not in the book. This was the stuff. So I've taken each image and broken it down into its own PCA vector. So now this is the smaller dimension. This is me representing these images with, with some new format of numbers. And now I can do the exact same item to item similarity that I did before, where I'm going to pick someone out of that, that list. Yeah, there's our boy, Tom Cruise. And I'm taking, so that's the item ID, right, like effectively. 
uh, I'm getting the item uh, factor, which in this case is the PCA uh, vector, uh, converting that into something that Spark likes. I'm doing the exact same cosine similarity, item to item similarity. And here's the grand finale. The top five people that, that look like Tom Cruise. <laughs> There's another girl. Got this guy. <laughs> and then, yeah. So that's it. That's my part. <laughs>